I've come up to Liverpool today because there is a brand new BAC Mono. Now the only trouble is that to the casual observer it looks pretty much identical to the original one. What's more, it's gone turbocharged, which sort of seems anathema to this sort of lightweight focused sports car. So, to get some answers, I'm going to talk to the design director of BAC Mono, Ian Briggs, on half of Briggs Automotive Company. Ian, thank you very much for talking us around this Pleasure, Henry. Car, Pleasure. Specifically this car, but we thought it would be nice to have the original car here, just as sort of point of reference uh, yeah. as we go along as well. So we don't get any jokes about that nothing's changed, or that we're lazy designers. <laughs> <laughs> let's start, um, because you're director of design, let's talk about the front of the car first um, and the different looks there, and why, why it's done, yeah. what you've changed, what it's all about. I mean, being open and honest as design director, of course, 10 years after we designed the original car, we want to uh, improve the look, we want to make it more, um, speak more of, of the current age uh, design aesthetic. But at BAC, everything we do, and I think Neil and I's relationship is such that, you know, I would never want to do something from a design point of view that would make the car less of the car that it is. So um, we wanted to clean up the front, we wanted to reduce frontal area, wanted to reduce drag, as you know, uh, lightweight sports cars ultimately have to, they have to fight against the wind at high speed like any car does and, uh, and it's doing it with less power than, than some of the big supercars and so we wanted to have a, a low drag. So um, we started off by looking, actually we started off looking at the regulations because as you see on the original mono, one of the first things you see is just the number of lights and we were using lights that were essentially off the shelf um, and it creates a lot of frontal area. Um, the other thing of course, as you know, uh, mass, we won't put mass in the middle. Mm -hmm. and we had a bit of a eureka moment as we were, as we were looking at the regulations. There's actually no uh, positional requirement for your main beam lights. So mm -hmm. that, coupled with the fact that going to Le Mans as, you know, in the 90s and seeing the GT cars <laughs> with the lights it's in the middle, so it's just cool. cool. It? Yeah. Exactly. So <laughs> I can say, I'm not going to pretend everything's just about function. Um, it's, got to, it's got to be cool as well. But, but what that did was it's put the weight of, the, of those lights uh, lower, more in the centre, and it's took them out of what is essentially the frontal area of the car because one of the things I've always loved about a single seat is if you imagine a, a driver as reclined as he can be, he has a silhouette. Mm -hmm. And the great thing about a single seat is the fuel tank's behind that silhouette, there's some components ahead of that silhouette, then there's, they've got the engine, then the gearbox, and everything stays within that frontal area. The least we could ever have would be a person and four wheels. Yeah. And so if I can put the lights in front of the wheel or at the rear behind the wheel, and if I can put components in front of that driver's silhouette or behind it, then that's the least frontal area we can have. Right. And so that's where it kind of started. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yes, we ended up with this, this new front, which is obviously sleeker, working down through the car. Let's, let's talk about the other major change from a sort of, you know, from a headline perspective, which is the fact you've gone turbo. That's something that most manufacturers have had to go that way. Being open honest, it enables us to sell the car into markets where we didn't curr currently or didn't in the past meet the uh, emissions regulations. Uh, but having said that, it's effectively took us to another level now. I mean, now we're at the point where we, we've got 25 horsepower more than the original um, or the current car, the 305 mm -hmm. horsepower car. And we're at the start of a journey power-wise that could take us a lot further. So. Um, as long as we, and we're putting, paying a lot of attention to it, as long as we get the right kind of power delivery characteristics, mm -hmm. um, we're confident that it'll still drive and feel like a mono. It'll meet the regulations and therefore be available to people who it's not available to at the moment. Um, and ultimately we can go quicker in the future. Absolutely. So the engine, um, in terms of figures, it's obviously still with Mantune yes. now, is yep. that right? Yeah, yeah. Um, 2.3 exactly. litres, four cylinders. Exactly. And what are the headline figures in terms of power and torque now? It's uh, 330 horsepower. Yeah. Um, it's just over 400 newton metres of torque. Um, there is a lot of work in the mapping that the way that 400 newton meters is delivered. Um, you don't get all of it in first gear right from the very beginning. Um, so it does drive and feel more like a normally aspirated car. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things I've certainly noticed is that as the mapping gives you more and more, as the tires are able to take more, uh, it, almost, it feels almost like a two-stroke go-kart in that it just feels like it's running away with you. It, it's pushing harder and harder with each new gear. Um, so it's, it's, it's a good feeling. It's good yeah. The uh, specialist components make our ECU. Um, Simtech make our body control units and do all, all of our electronics. And between them and Mount Tune, uh, working as a team with ourselves, 
the whole way the car delivers its power, the whole way the traction control would work, for example, the way the uh, information is displayed on the screen. That's, that's that whole team of companies that, uh, that all work together to deliver that. Yeah. It's obviously crucial, particularly with a, a lightweight car. Absolutely. And, and, and we're lighter now, despite the fact that we've got intercoolers and <laughs> turbos and all the rest of it. Um, I'll explain how we've managed to do that in a bit. But um, Yeah, because that is the... Obviously, turbocharging, drivability is one thing in terms of compared yes. to an actual respirator engine, but weight is obviously the other Absolutely. big negative. Um, so how have you managed it, to it, save it, weight, reposition it as well? I know that's being key. It's not, uh, it, it's, it's not as massive a negative as, as you would think, actually. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not too bad, um, but we have been able to offset the weight gains uh, other places in the car, the graphene body. Um, the wheels, which I think we'll come to yeah. uh, shortly. We're, we're very proud of them uh, and with the work we've done with Autodesk, um, our partner on those. Um, and uh, we've just gone through the whole car. One of the things I've, that's, that, that, I mean, I admire the companies who produce cars that have many different functions because it must be really hard to decide, do I make it more for, for Henry or more for Henry's girlfriend? You know what I mean? <laughs> where, do I, where, where do we go? Whereas with a single seater, there's absolutely one clear aim and it's all about get the mass down and to the center and reduce it you know and, and everything we do is about that it's a really purity, absolutely clear goal does it make it lighter can we put a different bolt in there can we have a thinner washer what can we do and it's and it's great to have that just a really clear goal and so that's what we've done we've gone through the whole car um I don't want to get too nerdy with you, but... but you know, please things, do, please do. <laughs> I mean, things like floor stays, for example. I mean, in the past, we had an adjustment at both ends. Well, actually, we don't need an adjustment at both ends. We can only need the adjustment at, at one end. And so we've saved one little tiny rose joint and one extra fixing. And we've kept um, that fixing out of the wind now. So we've reduced the drag. Um, we've simplified the component. We've made it a little bit lighter, cost a little bit less. It's a win-win, and that's, that, that's what I love about um, the single seat and this, this formula uh, or this concept of car, that it's, uh, it really it, is the, the goal the, is absolutely clear. Yeah, it's the, it, it does become the aggregation of marginal gains, doesn't yes, it? When, you yeah. sort of, when you're starting, let's face it, yep. at a pretty extraordinary yep. place in the first place to then get this better. Absolutely. Let's talk about, uh, you mentioned the, the body before and the graphene infused. Just talk us through a bit of that. So um, graphene, uh, originally uh, discovered uh, by Manchester University, um, the guys there got a Nobel Prize for it. It's the strongest material known to man. Um, and when added to various materials, it can um, enhance their properties. Uh, the, uh, the, the strength of the, of the carbon fiber panel uh, and its toughness are both improved and increased. What that means is we can take some carbon out and get back to where we were. Um, and so I think on the whole body set, we've saved about nine kilograms, which is a lot. We're, we're, I think we're about... There's uh, not a lot of body no, there, is there? So I saving nine we're, kilograms about, we're, we're about 40 kilograms on a body set now, which is the 44 carbon panels, um, total of 40 kilos. So, um, wow. yeah, no, it's, uh, like you say, it's marginal gains, but uh, they all add up. They all add up. Yeah, absolutely. Then there's a lot of 3D printing Yes. in this car, yeah. or perhaps not a lot, but there's, there's more than there, there was. This is something that has developed since the original was, Absolutely, was yeah. Produced. I think it was a little bit the same with the front lights. It was a bit of an aha moment for me because as a designer, I'd always known 3D printing as rapid prototyping. Yes. And in a way, it kind of, you only ever thought about it as being something to make a mock-up in the design studio. Um, whereas uh, we met um, our partner, DSM, um, they introduced us to all these di new different materials. As you can do, you can print carbon fibre filled plastics now, for example. Um, Which is, I think, you that's were saying, the mirror arm. Yeah, yeah this, this bit, yeah. exactly. That's 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 that, um, and that's a production solution. That's not a mock-up for a show. Uh, yeah. That's that's exactly how we'll make them. You can see from its design, it'd be a very complicated part to make in any other way. Actually, as a small company with a product at a high price point, we can afford a higher piece price in exchange for no tooling. Mm. But it's not just that, it also allows us to do things that you just couldn't tool, you know, you just, yeah. you couldn't make that or, or you couldn't make it without making it in multiple parts. Because um, you explained before, so somebody like VW, obviously a bracket for them, they need it to cost five pence. Exactly. And mm. they don't mind spending 15,000 in a little, you know, injection uh, forming tool that will deliver that. And I think that's also the reason why the original mono, we had 400 billet parts in the original mono, and it's the same argument. You know, they, the big guys can't afford to, to spend hundreds of pounds on a shear plate. We can, because we haven't spent hundreds of thousands <laughs> on press tools. Sure. Um, so it, it, what's great is it gives the customer a, a, better, a better part, 
um, and it gives us uh, uh, ultimate flexibility. The wheel's a great example. We tooled the carbon fibre rim. I mean, the way a tyre mounts to a rim is not going to change anytime soon. So that's, that's locked in. But the centre, which is a forged and then a billet machine aluminium centre, you could conceivably make it out of any material. You could make it out of other aluminiums, titanium, any other material. You can change the design just aesthetically if you want, or as we've done in this case, we've, um, we've reduced its weight. We've, we've introduced a new method of manufacture and, and made big weight gains. Yeah. So let's, overall, car, I think I'm right in saying, is 10 kilos yep. lighter. 570 kilos. Yeah. Absolutely. But some of the big gains... We'll talk about the wheels because we've got them here for a reason because obviously if you can save weight in terms of unsprung and rotational exactly. mass that's uh, sort of it's gains on gains on gains Absolutely. isn't it in terms of particularly yeah. for a car like I this i mean i think it's fair to say that the best place to save the weight on the car is the tire because it's the furthest away from the center sure. and, it, and it's all those things you just mentioned and then it's the rim and then it's the wheel and then it's the disc and so it goes on and again it's just clear it's clear <laughs> where you should focus and that's that's the great thing about it so let's talk about, um, should we yes. these up? Sure. Because, so what we've got here is effectively the sort of a, a progression through, and this is the original wheel Correct. center. Obviously in the past, uh, FEA analysis would, would look at the, um, the forces uh, in the wheel, an engineer would look at the areas of high stress, low stress, and he would make changes and, and optimize it. With Autodesk, our partner, they've de developed uh, with Fusion 360, uh, it's, it's generative design. So essentially the algorithm's doing that thousands and thousands of times, and it can output as many versions as, as you would like. You can put in the material, you can put in the manufacturing method. So this, this one was made with a three axis milling machine, which does limit a little bit where you can, where you can have access to. Okay. This one is the version we've used on the new mono. It's 1.2 kilograms we've saved. Um, and ultimately, just for, just for reference, you can take a look at that. That's, the, um, that's where it could go to ultimately. That could take the same <laughs> forces that's been calculated to all the same loads just all the redundant material has been taken away. Of course, when it gets to that level, you have to be looking at printing. Yes, which then adds complication and costs. Exactly. This sort of it, it will, it will come. Thing. It will yeah. come as everything as the costs come down. But uh, that's ultimately where so I'm, I'm looking into the future here. So Absolutely. Yeah, I think so too. And I think also from a design point of view, you, you can't just put that on a car where every component wasn't designed that way. I think eventually, you know, you. Our eyes will get used to that aesthetic. We've seen it in nature, of course. Yeah. Um, it's, an, it's an incredibly organic sort of look, isn't it? But yeah. even if comparing, so this is obviously then you come back, sort of you come back a stage yes, as it were exactly. to this, which then which can is be what produced we've done here. exactly, exactly um, in a way that's more feasible, as it were. And it's extraordinary because there's obviously an engineering benefit to this you've taken out material but yes. it's also more beautiful, isn't it, from a from a design perspective? There's I, a it's subtle. I, I but think so too. It's just. I mean, that, that's something with the aesthetic of mono. Um, we, we've always wanted it to look like um, this glossy body uh, pulled tight over the machine in the same way an, an athlete looks, you know, um, that, that shape, that's shaped by nature, that athletic form. And effectively, that's what we've now got here. Um, as we've gone from three axis machining to five axis machining and using the, the, the generative design algorithms, it's enabled us to see where we can remove material. And you're absolutely right. You end up with that even more athletic, more slender, more optimized form, which our eyes recognize from nature. We've see, we see it everywhere in nature. Absolutely. And then obviously the final, product is this, which is phenomenally light overall. What is the overall weight for? A 4.7. 4.7, wow. I mean, when you, when, you, when you pick it up like that and pass it to someone, yeah. they, they know straight <laughs> away that it's, that it's not going to be heavy. No, absolutely. And then behind here, we have actually got a yes. brake caliper, which is obviously AP Racing. So it's AP is, Racing, can't yeah. take any credit for that, but it's the same type of a process has been used to optimize that design and compared to the, um, the same caliper from AP that we chose uh, years ago for the original mono, that's 300 grams. So, you know, that's 1.5 kilograms per corner. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's holy grail. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and then let's just talk about the back of the car as well in sure. terms of the packaging. Yes. Because, um, again, everything has just been trimmed down, I suppose. And it's one of the things I remember seeing in mono for the first time. And I think it's sometimes difficult to get across to people sort of where the, where the money goes, I suppose. If yes. They think yep. it's a single-seater and is right. it sort of... But all the engineering is so clearly 
on display back here. And right. it is a, a beautiful thing to look at if you like engineering, which most car people sure, do, don't sure. they? And it's, so yeah. I think that was very instrumental in a lot of the decisions that were made. The longitudinal engine, the Formula Car gearbox through our partners, Hewland, um, it gives you such an optimised form here. If we'd have taken a transverse engine and gearbox from a front-wheel drive car and, and put it there, not to criticise those, those, those companies doing that, they're, they're operating at a different price point, but, but that's where the cost is. You know, that, d doing it that way is not the, an inexpensive way of doing it, and it has a knock-on effect to lots of other things, but of course it has positive knock-on effects as well. We get much better aerodynamics, we get much better uh, weight balance, uh, we get a much lower centre of gravity. It pays us back all the time, but it's not the least expensive way of doing it, that's for sure. Absolutely. In terms of design, you were saying before, the lights have been taken again. Everything is trying to get, get it out of this space Exactly, here. exactly. So uh, the original mono had uh, its fog and reverse, which we need by law, but we've now managed to put them both one above the other uh, in a single unit on the centre line. Um, we've managed to take the rear lights and put them into the silhouette of the rear wheels. Um, we've managed to do the same with the reflectors. So when you look from the rear of the car now, the wheels have become slightly bigger and the visual elements that are required by law have, have all necessarily become slightly less prominent. And I think the overall effect, it makes the rear look more open, but it also makes the rear look stronger. What's also changed at the rear is the, uh, and the front actually, is the, is the wishbones. So we've got a narrower profile. It's, it's a longer cord, but, a, but less height. So again, uh, less drag. Um, that also uh, increases strength for us as well. Um, the car's now got slicks and, and wet race tyres which are available, developed with Pirelli specifically for mono for the first time ever. These, uh, these Trofeo these R's? These are the Trofeo R's. Which and these again developed specifically? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. This the, I, I don't know how much you know about the road regulations, but they're getting really strict on rolling resistance and it's very hard to make a tyre. Obviously, it's diametrically opposed. <laughs> the stickier it is, the harder it is to roll. And so Pirelli uh, recognised that this is a challenge amongst all of their high-performance tyres, um, and especially on such a lightweight vehicle. So they went yes. really deep into the construction and the compound of tyre that they would meet the regulations in a straight line, but the moment you start leaning on it, you switch the rubber on, the carcass starts to move, um, and then the whole thing becomes soft and starts to work. And uh, it's, been, it's, been, it's been a revelation, I have to say. Absolutely. Uh, I can see the lovely Olin's dampers in there, of course, and hopefully we'll get to drive it at some point and find out what you've done Absolutely. in terms of suspension-wise. Yes. The other thing I can see is obviously just this is, is subtle, but you now almost sort of sit slightly inside the... Um, exactly. That, that's, all a, that's all the result a result of, of this area, exactly. What we've done is um, we've managed to lower the, the bodywork, but without changing the structure. Uh, we've also narrowed this area behind the driver's head. And if you see from the original car, there was, a, there was lots of layers and there was lots of frontal area that was built you know, to the left and right of the driver's head. And we've now moved this area forward and closer. So all these surfaces in here are effectively an offset of a helmet. So in, in CAD, we've took a helmet and we've just offset it. And then we've tried to bring all those surfaces with an equal distance to his helmet, which is whatever we, we, we considered to be the amount of space he would need. Um, we've done something with the headrest as well. Um, that gives us a bit more flexibility. What we try to do is when we mould the seat to the driver, we, because um, different helmets are, are, have different thicknesses, obviously different guys sit in slightly different positions, but a helmet like a Stilo is a much thicker helmet, for yeah. example, than an RI. Uh, and so this allows us now, the way we fix this, we're like, we can adjust that much easier at the build stage for the customer. And whilst we're around here as well, and obviously I can't see it from here, but if I look over there, you can obviously see the intake that is new on that side yes. as well. If you recall back to Mono R, that was the controversial Formula 3 style airbox. <laughs> um, and we had lots of suggestions about doing it on both sides and things <laughs> like that, but um, joking aside, no, um, obviously we don't need the ram air effect that we wanted for the normally aspirated engine. So it's a much lower intake. We've gone uh, to a panel filter, but given the, the challenges of the turbo engine, as you know, you've, at some point you have to cross the engine on a four cylinder. You've got to get to the opposite side. Yeah. Um, and we've managed to put the panel filter right next to the engine. We go into this side, across the front of the engine and straight into the turbo at the same height as the turbo. So that's really clean. We come out the top of the turbo straight into the top of the intercooler. So that's a really short way. Yeah. Then out the bottom of the intercooler, we go directly under the engine and with our partner mount tube, the dry sump has actually got a, a small raised section in it. So we can come directly under the engine and straight up into the inlet. I can't imagine a shorter route. 
uh, I mean, given that you have to cross the car. Yeah. Um, so we're really, really pleased with that. It keeps it light and it also affects how the car drives, which is um, you know, a positive, reducing any kind of turbo lag. Absolutely. Which on such a lightweight car, it, it isn't resistant to getting going anyway. So no. it, it doesn't suffer in the same way a two-ton car would, where you've got you nothing got to get you going. Sort of, you haven't got yeah. that inertia, exactly. Yeah. So all those things combined, the short induction route, the lightweight, um, and then the mapping we've done with our other partners, it drives like a mono. I hope you found all that as fascinating as I did. The price for all of this, all 570 kilos of it, is £165,950, which is, well, let's face it, junior supercar money. It's a lot for a single-seater, but then it has, let's face it, senior supercar performance, as we know from the original. And I think that it is a thing of real beauty, something that has been you know, crafted, engineered, something that's beautiful to look at in a way that well, supercars and hypercars, the sort of the Koenigseggs of this world really are, which obviously cost an awful lot more. When you know what is beneath the skin of it, I think it seems actually remarkably good value and obviously completely different.